Welcome to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast with me, Dan Haylett. This show will help you navigate the intricate financial and non-financial landscape of retirement planning, investment and income strategies, and the human experience beyond the traditional work-life paradigm. Join me as I delve into the challenges, triumphs, and unexpected journeys individuals face as they transition into this new phase of life. From experts across many different areas to personal stories, we uncover the secrets, insights, and practical tips to empower you on your retirement journey. Whether you're just starting to consider retirement or already enjoying this chapter, this podcast is your guide to making the most out of this remarkable phase of life. Now, on to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. I'm your host, Dan Haylett. Today's conversation is with the doctor of happiness, Dr. Andy Cope. Andy is a well-being expert, best-selling author, and in his words, a recovering academic. He specializes in positive psychology and the science of human flourishing. The reward for grinding out his Loughborough PhD is that he gets to call himself a doctor of happiness. Now, if you put the cheesy title to one side, Andy believes there has never been a more important time to focus on mental health and well-being. He has been described as a well-being revolutionary, and his mission is to change the narrative and refocus psychology away from what's wrong with people to what's right. And his messages act as a gentle nudge towards people taking charge of their own mental health. People love Andy's simplicity and humour, and his keynote themes of well-being, leadership, resilience, and change resonate with audience around the world. Andy's books are frequently on the bestsellers list. The Art of Being Brilliant, Shine, and Zest have all topped the personal development charts. The Little Book of Emotional Intelligence and Leadership, Multiplier Effect, are riding high in the business charts, and Happiness Route Map was nominated as the Independent's Best Self-Help Book of the Year. He also moonlights as a children's author. His Spy Dog series has sold in excess of a million copies worldwide. In this conversation, Andy shares some brilliant insights into well-being and happiness in retirement, which involves living more in the present moment and finding contentment in simple experiences and positive relationships. Interestingly, Andy challenges the notion of retirement as a destination for happiness and encourages individuals to prioritise their well-being throughout their lives with an importance of saying yes to growth and new experiences, as well as saying no to things they don't enjoy. I hope you get as much from this conversation as I did. So without any further hesitation, let's get straight to the conversation with the doctor of happiness, Andy Cope. Andy Cope, the Doctor of Happiness. A very warm welcome to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Dan. I'm excited to be here. Can't wait for this conversation. We were just speaking, um, but before we hit record, and I think the Doctor of Happiness might be a little bit more happy than normal because your beloved Derby County have just got promoted. So that that's a good thing, right? Well, it is a good thing. It's a rare thing as well, mate, because uh, we did lose 21 points and got demoted you know relegated a couple of yeah, several times so yeah i mean it depends when you're listening to this podcast but if you're currently listening to it as a derby fan i'm a very happy man which is quite a rare thing for a derby fan to be <laughs> so li- li- listen andy i am super excited to have this conversation um i don't think i've had in the um 40 odd episodes of the podcast i don't think i've had anyone as more qualified and passionate and devoted to the subject of well-being and happiness as yourself. So can't wait to, to dig in. Um, I'm, I'm really intrigued for, uh, and personally curious, and I know the listeners will be, to just to kind of for you to spend five, 10 minutes or so talking about you, your journey, how you, how you kind of become the doctor of happiness um, and your uh, brilliant business, the art of brilliance that does um, some wonderful things about uh, well-being, et cetera. Take, take me on the journey and how you, how you got to where you are now. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah. Kind of accidental. I, uh, um, 
I would describe myself as a recovering academic. So uh, I have got a PhD from Loughborough Uni in the science of human flourishing, so positive psychology. So it's basically, for the, for the uninitiated, um, psychology traditionally for 150 years of, its, of it being around has been what we call a disease model. So psychologists, they're into phobias, disorders, anxiety, depression, paranoia, schizophrenia, trauma is the one coming through. So what psychologists have done for 150 years very nobly, I'm not dissing it in any way because I did it as well, is let's find out what's wrong with you and then let's try and put you right. So here's some therapy, here's some meds, here's some counselling, whatever. And I get that and I think that's fantastic. But what I realised in 2005 when my research kicked in, that despite 150 years of trying to do the best they can, psychologists, the best therapy, the best counselling, the best meds we can come up with, the truth is that mental ill health has been getting worse, not better. So it's been skyrocketing. Um, and you, 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 we, off air, we spoke about you having, you know, two daughters of teenagers. The number of schools I go into, mate, where kids are kids that, that the median age of of uh, mental ill health is coming down and down and down. I, I, I meet kids age nine on anxiety meds, and it doesn't fit right. It doesn't sit right with me because I think that the, it's like a quite a toxic environment out there in the moment. So basically, what I did in two thousand and five, my PhD was to uh, what I realised that the, the huge thing that, that psychology has been so predicated on looking at what, it, illness that it's never looked at wellness. So it, we've been so busy looking at how we can fix people. We, we've taken our eye off the small minority who don't need fixing. There's, there's people out there with a smile on their face and a spring in their step. And for you listening to this podcast, I guarantee you can all think of a handful of people in your life who've got something extra. An extra smile, an extra spring. Uh, they they like rock up on a Monday with a with a with a smile on the face, even on a Monday morning. It's a bit weird, really. These are your work colleagues who go the extra mile. You don't have to ask them ten times; it's just built into them. They create strong relationships. The business benefits are off the scale, but the but the personal benefits are, are bigger than that. So while the rest of psychology continues to look at the disease model, look at what's not working, look at the therapy and the counselling, I decided to flip it on its head and look at psychology from the other end of the telescope. Is like, who are the happy people, right? Because that is really interesting. I think psychology doesn't know the answer to that. So not only who are they, but what are they doing that allows them to flourish? And thirdly, most importantly, the business that I've built and the books that I write are essentially taking the learning from them. What could we learn from people who are like buzzing with life and vitality that we could borrow off them, like ideas that they're doing that we could implement in our own lives so we might also be buzzing with health and vitality? And although it sounds obvious when I say it like that, it's pretty much still a fairly new subject is the science of uh, human flourishing. So that's what I did. Set out to, uh, and the PhD nearly killed me. Ironically, made me unhappy. You know, because as a PhD, you've got to learn about data and analysis and all this uh, stuff. But what comes out of the research eventually, after 12 years of hard, hard academic labor, is some really quite clear, simple, obvious, quick wins that will just raise your game. From I call it from from mental health to mental wealth. Is we all want that. We all want. I mean, my my research people, the people I re ended up researching, I call them two percenters. That might be a recurring theme of this podcast. There. So when you plot people on a graph of happiness and well-being the two percenters a small percentage of people at the top of that graph the ones we've ignored on the grounds of them not being ill so i call them the two percenters they've got like 30 percent more happiness they've got about 40 percent more energy than a normal human and quite frankly man, I, I call it not research me search i wanted to be one <laughs> yeah absolutely there's a selfish element to these podcasts for me as well i love getting this message out but i take huge amounts of personal uh, learning and growth from speaking to people like yourself uh, 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 and other experts. It's definitely me search. Absolutely. And I having just, just going back to my two teenage daughters, I think I absolutely concur that I don't think it's ever been a stress as a stressful time for anybody, right? This is, social media, I think is, has a big part to play with this. And I know you've got a wonderful course about detoxing off social media or what it um but you know and, and it, it's kind of chicken and egg for my kids it's what you know one of them is very very artistic theater singing and it's a way she expresses herself but it's also a way that she affects her mental uh, well-being as well so i think i absolutely concur with you on on that stuff and the rise of positive psychology can't be quick enough fast enough because we need to reframe this from broken people to, as you said, getting the best bits out of the happy people and understanding 
what the triggers are for that, and then learning off the off 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 the back of all of those. You've nailed it, mate. It's pre- but essentially, it's preventative. So what what positive psychology what psychology does, and again, I'm not putting the boot in because I think it's really valuable. Is they'll wait for you to break, and then they'll try and fix you. That's what psychology, right? If one of your daughters has mental health issues, you got to wait six months to get an appointment. But eventually, they'll sit down with a professional and try and piece them back together. And it costs a an, an ridiculous amount of money and effort to wait till they're broken and then fix them. Positive psychology is about. It's more proactive. It's about if we could equip people with a very basic knowledge and skills to be able to take good care of their own mental health and well-being, then when the world does its worst, which it is at the moment, it's battering people. Right? You switch the news on right now, and it's grim. And and work pressures they're real, right? And the weather isn't always sunny. You know, it does rain on people. So the weather is uh, sorry. The the world is kind of quite toxic. So if but if we could learn how to look after our own well-being, then when the bad stuff does happen which plot spoiler it will in everybody's life is that you won't break so it's it's like self care really it's personal personal tlc <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely um I, I, we'll come back throughout the conversation andy about some of the great work that you've got your books and the courses that you that you offer which all, all the links and everything could be in the show notes for people to check out and see if this stuff resonates so i think it's it, it's just brilliant work that you and your team uh, do on this um I do want to, uh, uh, and I think, you know, as much as this podcast and the work that I do is focused on retirement and, and helping people through one of the biggest transitions that they have, both from a human point of view, so kind of forget the money, um, and from a kind of true wealth or real wealth point of view, which, as you've rightly said, is very holistic, right? Wealth is not just the pound signs. Um, so um, as much as it's about that, I think what we've got to talk about today can be applied to many people in many stages of life so I just want to kind of caveat that but I will mention obviously the word retirement a lot but I think most people can get a lot out of this um and and I suppose the first thing I want to do and we touched on it a a little bit I don't think I don't think it's ever been as uh, it's ever been more important to focus on your well-being and happiness as it is today given all of the pressures that you've rightly just said and how noisy the world is so i'm really curious to understand from you kind of um why do you think it's never been more important to focus on our well-being and happiness especially when it comes to these really crucial retirement years that people are entering entering into yeah you're right it is i mean happiness is the number one thing you want for your kids everybody listen to this it's the only it's the only thing you want so, it, but it, it, it permeates all ages. It's and I think happiness. The thing about um, as you get a bit older and you and you look to retirement or you are at retirement age, is essentially your happiness. What what you viewed as happiness will change throughout your life. So, if I was, I'm 57 at the moment, right? So, if I could whisper back to my 18 year old self and say, do you know what? When you're 57, mate, Friday night, you'll love to stay in with your wife and watch Netflix. That'll be your best night, right? But my 18 year old self will go, you are joking. You, you, you know, you lose her. You've lost the, you've lost the will to live. And because I would have been out partying hard, I would have thought that was a good night out. So actually, as you get a bit older, you have this uh, essentially happen. It's quite complicated, really, in in terms of what trying to even define what happiness is. Because most psychologists wouldn't talk about happiness. They talk about, they call it subjective well-being. Um, and subjective well-being means essentially what makes you happy won't make me happy. It's, a, it's in our own heads type thing. But happiness is a sort of a continuum from at one end of the happiness spectrum. There's this kind of manic, woohoo, manic explosion of happiness. Um, and at the other end of the happiness continuum is this sense of quiet contentment, of living a life well lived, of being happy with who you are and what you've achieved. And I think as you get to retirement, you're less woohoo and you go back. If you can find that quiet contentment, mate, that is a life well lived. And that it, it would be nice to have some money in the bank, of course, but that's it's not really about that. It's about the relationships you build, and um, being happy with yourself, being happy with with your lot. Yeah, I talk a lot about this, and and um, 
uh, a great friend of mine who's been on the podcast, Brian Portnoy, who's wrote books called, um, or he's got a company called Shaping Wealth, wrote The Geometry of Wealth. He talks about funding contentment all of the time. And um, there's two types of happiness, isn't there, really? This is kind of like ex- it kind of internal and external. So like experiential happiness, that one-time dopamine hits of things that kind of make you happy. But actually, do you know what doesn't cost a lot of money? That kind of internal foundational happiness, positive relationships, time outside, spending time with people that you want to spend with, um, you know, giving our time away to causes that 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 kind of we love and are passionate about. Um, that kind of thing. And 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 I think it's I think the the experiential happiness, the, the one time dopamine hits are often the things that people focus on because it's a bit more tangible, doesn't take as hard a work to go, I'm gonna go and uh, watch Derby County get promoted on the game and you know, but but actually um you know, those one time things. But I do a lot of I have a lot of conversations to spend a lot of time with people thinking about the contentment side of happiness. What are the foundational things that are really, really important to live a life well lived? Yeah. And I think obviously I'm not saying money's not important. Money is really important. There's, you know, you'll have covered it in 40 episodes about can money buy happiness or not. And without me going too deeply into that, um, yes, it actually, you know, it helps. It can't buy happiness, but money can certainly buy, um, it can buy choice, it can buy comfort, it can buy a couple of tickets to somewhere with palm trees, you know what I mean? So yeah. ha- money's really, really important. It gives you that safety net. Um, so it, you can buy it. But I, it, back to what you just said in terms of if everybody listening to this podcast, get a pen and paper and write down the top 10 happiest moments of your life, right? And there should be loads, but if you, it's really hard to do that. But if you did, I can fairly guarantee that there won't be any products on that list. It won't be the time you bought a big 40-inch TV. It will be time spent with people that you love, doing very simple things, and potentially with no Wi-Fi. But it will all be with very simple experiences with people you love. So in terms of money, um, in terms of buying a product, that's that also I'll give you the quick dopamine hit. But actually spending money on an experience, if you want to spend some money, then spend it on an experience with people you love. That's where you'll get your best bang for your buck. Yeah, I talk about that a lot, right? I think pe- people are so scared and fearful about running out of money that what they end up, they don't leave money on the table. They leave memories and experiences on the table at age 90 when they can't physically go and do them anymore with the people. And actually the people that they wanted to do with them, do them with are probably maybe not there or can't do it anymore. So, um, you know, I think that buying buying memories and experiences should be the job of your hard-earned money that you've spent multi-decades accumulating to give you that purpose to go and do that. I really love what you said, Andy, about thinking about the top 10 things that that have brought you happiness. Um, and I think if you've done that and you're thinking about your retirement, you can then extrapolate that forward a little bit. So you go, actually, if these things have brought me happiness, then surely that should be that should bring me happiness in the future. So how do I how do I do more of that over here? Yeah, I, I think I th- and I've written I've written about it in a couple of books. There's a big difference between your to do list and your to be list. So ever but most people are manically crazy, crazy, busy doing ticking things off your to do list. And most people, you 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 know, you're a businessman, so am I. I've got so many things to do. I I, I can get giddy trying to tick everything off my to. I've got too many things to do. I can never get to the bottom of my to do list. So, but well, that's what most people will go their entire life which is about 4,000 weeks, by the way, which is like nobody gets out alive. So got limited time, like headless chickens trying to tick things off our to-do list. And I'm sympathetic to that. However, where positive psychology is over the other side, it's, it's what I call your to-be list. So it's about a thousand times more important than your to-do list. But it, your to-be list requires a bit of honesty and courage to dare to point the finger back at yourself and say, right, who am I being while I'm doing those things on my to-do list? So am I being present, which is kind of quite rare in the modern days? Am I being kind? And am I being compassionate? Am I being loving? Am I being optimistic, hopeful, positive? Or am I accidentally in the modern world being stressed out, up to the eyeballs, anxious and, and um, distracted? So I think a lot of this comes down to learning to be your best self, stepping into that best version of you that already exists, but the world's trying to knock you out of best self mode and into busyness. Hi everyone, Dan here. 
I just wanted to jump in real quick to say that if you are thinking about or unsure where to start with your retirement plans, then I've put together what I believe to be one of the best free resources for you. My retirement toolkit is packed with videos, guides, webinars, worksheets, blogs, and podcast episodes, and is completely free to download. Just go to the show notes where you will find the link. Now, let's get back to the show. I think if you can get into a mindset or speak to your spouse or family members or a professional or a coach or whoever you want to work with to talk about this stuff, it is truly transformational. I've seen it. You've seen it, Andy, you know, when people start exploring this. Um, I, I also um, talk a lot about what, what I've coined the challenge of who. Um, and and I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Simon Sinek's work, you know, start with why to a degree. But I do think there's another layer here. And I, I just, I'm really curious to get your thoughts because I think it plays into what you just said. Um, I believe if we can discover who we were, think about who we are and think about who we want to be. So like the three dimensions of we need to go back a little bit. We need to figure out who we are right now and then who we want to be. It comes to that kind of to be list that you want to do. But you might need to go back a few years to figure out some of the things. You might need to kind of understand where we are now. I'm curious to understand, if, is that something that you've thought about that, you know, really trying to dig deep into who we are and who we want to be? Yeah, I think the truth is that we've all got this. Uh, everybody's t- there's a big talk about living your best life and being your best self is you know social media is a hashtag best life but there's very few people living their best life like genuinely being their best self so what all we're interested is i call it i don't call it personal development i call it personal remembering right because we are amazing we're all incredible human beings but the world we've got this collective amnesia the world is so manic and so crazy and so full on that I haven't got time to be happy. You know what I mean? In fact, retirement, we call it destination addiction. It's like happiness is this sort of emotional pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So happiness, oh, we all want to be happy, right? So, and it starts really young. Let's, I'll, I'll give you, so, you know, when you're in primary school, what your teachers tell you, because they love you, they say, if you work really hard in primary school, you'll get really good SATS results. And when you get those great SATS results, guess what, kids? Then you'll be happy. And then you go to big school. Teachers are the same and your parents. If you work really hard in year 11, right, you'll get really good GCSEs. And when you open that envelope, you'll be leaping around the hall, high-fiving your friends because then you'll be happy. Then you'll have a job. You'll have a sales target. And when you hit your sales target, then you'll be happy. Well, classically, you'll be happy when you're walking down the aisle with your perfect partner. So what happens is most people are desperately kind of kicking this happiness into the long grass. It's over there. I've got to earn it. I've got to pursue it. I've got to make happiness mine, but it's it's in the distance. Whereas what we're talking about is what if that's totally incorrect, right? And what if happiness is um, is at this end of the rainbow? What if it's already here, but we're just really bad at seeing it? So if we go back through the examples, what if it's the happiest primary school kids that do really well at SATs? So what if happiness is like good for your results? What if it's the happiest teenagers that overperform at GCSEs because happiness is good for your growth mindset and your learning and your motivation? What if it's the happiest salesperson that gets the most sales? Because it is. Or what if being happy now is the key to finding your perfect partner and walking down the aisle? So I think in terms of destination addiction, putting happiness off till retirement, I think we need to start right here, right now. That's where happiness always is. Um, it's right here, right now. It's just that we're blinkered. We don't see it. Brilliant. Well, let me give you an, I'll give you an example, Matt. I'll give you an example. Give you an, all right, I did a session. I won't say which um, police force it was, but um, I think you can retire at a copper at age 55. And there's a, I'm, I'm, there's a young lad there. What was he, 30? And he came to me at break. I was doing our flagship after being brilliant with his police force. And he was a nice enough float, but he came to me at break time over a coffee. He said, oh, he says, only 25 more years to go. You must hear this every day in your job, right? It's like, that is destination addiction. So I said, what do you mean? He says, well, in 25 years, I can be happy because I'll get my pension and I'll retire. I'm like, he's literally yeah. wishing his life away. He's discounting this 25 years now and he's kicking up into the long grass. And I think, right, your job is to, when people do get to retirement, they've got enough money that they can have a good life, all right? But don't take your eye off now. Yeah, oh, look, I, I think I, 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 uh, I sketch a lot that you've probably seen. And one of the sketches that I do with people live is when, when I start working with them, it's like, what do you see retirement as? Is it the finish line or the start line? Right? It's kind of, 
you know, because people, again, this destination, it's kind of, I've, it, it's a finish line of a thing that, and again, like you said, I've been, there's some ingrained beliefs through things that I've observed and witnessed and been told since the age of five, that when you get to this thing, it equals happiness. Well, if you're not happy entering it, you're not going to be happy, like going through it effectively. So, um, and it's that mindset, isn't it? Well, it's in my head, right? Let me give you a better example. Because again, you're talking about this bit gets ingrained really early on. This is funny, but not funny, right? So I, I write kids books as well. So m- many years ago, I got to um, be a guest author of a, of a book festival in Halifax, right? It's a bit of a backstory, but I won't give you all that. So I've got about, what have I got? 400 year five. So what are they? About nine years old. So every nine year old in Halifax is invited to this event. I'm one of the speakers, one of the authors. I'm sitting at the back waiting to be introduced. I'm sitting on this girl's table with these nine year old girls. And this little girl next to me, huffing and puffing and rolling her eyes. She's like, <sighs> like giving it all the histrionics. And I said, I said to her, what's up with you? She said, oh, she says, I've had enough. I said, what do you mean? You've only just arrived. What do you mean you've had enough? Oh, not just today, she says. She, says, and she looks at me with these big brown eyes. She says, I can't wait to retire. I'm like, hang on. Oh, my You're God. nine. <laughs> she's nine years old, mate. In terms of that happiness rainbow, oh. she's kicking her happiness into the long grass about 65 years away. And I think so where, but my point made me think about while you were talking is where she learned that, right? She's learned that from the big people. She's learned that from parents who are, and I I love my dad, right? And he's still knocking around, but, and he's my hero growing up. But my dad would, would, would go out of the door on a Monday with a heavy heart and bounce back in on a Friday clapping his hands. So even when I was five, I was subconsciously learning that Mondays are bad and Fridays are good. Right, that put you got to wait till Friday to be happy, and it's so ingrained. It seeps in TGI Friday. Thank gosh it's Friday, and I'm like, well, let's reverse that. TGI Monday. Well, thank gosh it's Monday. I'm still alive. I'm still here. If I'm going to rise, I may as well shine and give life a right good go. Sorry, I'm back back to you, but I just couldn't. But the Halifax thing, honestly, mate. That must have been your toughest gig. I would. I stand up and present in front of a load of people. If I had to stand up and present in front of a load of nine-year-olds, I'd be terrified. Absolutely terrified. Nine are nine are all right. It's fifteen-year-olds that are talking. Oh, yeah, about, yeah, yeah, mate. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but I think you're yeah, absolutely true, right? And I think this is, you know, people have put so much emphasis on the date that they leave work to be the catalyst for happy life. There was a study done uh, by the ONS that I saw a couple of weeks ago that showed the decline of happiness. Um, So like, you know, happiness peaks, it's a bit out of date now, I think it finished in 2018, 19. But happiness um, tends to get really high when we're in our late teens, um, kind of early 20s, it falls during life, because we work, typically have children, money worries come in, and then it peaks up again, uh, like, uh, you know, as you go into retirement. And as you're saying, it's kind of like this, obviously, this is just drudge of life that people are just putting themselves into a position that they're putting everything onto this kind of one day that they have no idea when it's going to be. They have no idea how long it's going to be for. Um, and, and and again, it's just ingrained, I think, but the financial service industry and uh, like have got a lot to answer for when it comes to this. They 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 portray this wonderful life sitting on a beach at age 65 with uh, pounds in the pension fund and get to that point and we'll help you save and get to that point. They don't talk about well-being in a way that they should absolutely talk about well-being because you know the, the the pounds in the bank and the day and and the age that you have is 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 where your happiness comes from. And I think it is a complete load of rubbish. So typically, I say to people, look, if I can if I can work with people um, early enough, great. But if you're thinking about retirement, I need to work with you for at least a three year run into you for you to make that make that decision properly and feel like you know what you're retiring to, not necessarily everything about what you're retiring from. Yeah, yeah, good, good. No, I think the, the well being um, tapping into the well being there of of your clients. I mean, that's what they really want is mental wealth mental wealth and that and that like i said that's part part of having some money in the bank but it's part of knowing how to live your best life and and being your best self it boils down to that really i mean talking about being your best self i i had no idea we went back to 2005 the world was very different when i started my phd the living your best life and being your best self wasn't a thing anxiety hadn't been invented there were no, people were anxious, in to, or they might have been, but they weren't talking about it in 2005. So I had no idea at the start of my research that I was going to 
actually accidentally stumble across the science of living your best life. I mean, it was news to me. Um, I didn't know I was going to make a career out of it. I didn't know I was going to write books about it. I was just researching it because I was curious. I had the, the question that launched my PhD, let me, let me give it to your listeners, right? Little question in my little Derby head. Um, must have been 2004 in my head. Could you be happier even if nothing in the world around you changed? Right. So just now, it's not a trick question, but just let that rattle around a couple of times. Could you be happier even if nothing in the world around you changed? Because my answer, Dan, to me was yes. All right. So, and this is a really weird admission because essentially what I was saying to myself is I had the potential to be happier. The world didn't need to change. I had the potential to be happier, but I, I wasn't being. And therefore, the biggest thing, the biggest barrier to me feeling amazing was actually me. All right. So it wasn't the boss and it wasn't the weather and it wasn't the train strikes. It the, 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 actually there was something I could do. I just wasn't being as happy as I could have been. I thought it might just be me. So uh, I was happening to do a, a conference a couple of days later. So I had asked about 300 people that saying, because I was curious, by the way, folks, could you be up here even if nothing in the world around you changed? And out of that audience of 300, about 290 hands sort of went up. They were looking perplexed because they'd never thought about it before. But they were going, yeah, yeah, we could actually be. So therefore, what my PhD was about is about helping you get out of your own way. <laughs> You're blocking your own sunlight here, people. So I essentially found out a bunch of what I call intentional strategies. So it's not about what's happening outside of you. You know, it, if you think about my two presenters, my happy people, they live in exactly the same external world as everybody else. So their train gets cancelled. It rains on them as well. But they have these what I call intentional stra- intentional strategies, these mostly habits of thinking. So, for example, they're not kicking their happiness into the long grass. They're not, you know, they're, they are excited about the holiday, but they're also equally excited about today. I think, it, again, it, it's a wonderful way to start reframing this. And, and I'm, I, I'm interested, and you, you've, you've, you've kind of talked a little bit, well, quite a bit about this, but... Um, let, let's kind of try and maybe summarize a bit of this. I think it'd be really interesting. So we've talked about positive psychology, but how can that, how can we use positive psychology to help us reframe a number of those internal and learnt beliefs? Because that's kind of what we've been saying, isn't it? It's kind of the, the learnt belief is if it rains on us, we should be miserable. But the two percenters in your world, it rains on them, and they've got they've they've rewired their internal and learnt beliefs to a way to make them go, well, we'll just move forward with this. So is, you know, I think it's really right. interesting that yeah. topic in general. And that and that applies to anyone entering into retirement as well. Right, mate. Here we go. This is, I mean, this is proper deep, but let's keep it simple. Let me tell you a quick story, right? I don't know how much time we've got, but um beliefs, right? Beliefs are so powerful. Um and people die for their beliefs. So I'm not going to go too deeply into this. But um, a belief is what you've got in your head, your model of the world, right? But now the, your beliefs aren't true, but you really think they are. So, so this is, let me just go with it. Let me give you, an, let me give you a quick story. So uh, again, I, it does appear in one of the books, but I, a true story. How do you, ca- how do you catch a monkey? How do you catch a baby monkey? All right. So assuming you own a zoo and you needed some monkeys for the zoo, what they actually do, how you catch a monkey, you go into the, let's fly into West Africa, into the rainforest. And the monkey catcher will take, go into the rainforest. They'll take a spade, a cage, and a bunch of bananas. So you go into the forest, you take a cage, a spade, a bunch of bananas. They'll dig a hole in the forest floor. They fit a cage into the hole, put a banana in the cage. Then whoever set the trap will go and hide behind a tree. Right, and they wait there and they wait until eventually the monkeys come through the forest and one of the monkeys in the troop runs over the cage it looks down it sees the banana and it thinks i like bananas right so the monkey puts its hand in the cage and grabs a banana but the cage has been very cleverly designed so it can get its hand in but once it's made a fist and grabbed the banana it can't get its hand out again so now the monkey's is perplexed right because it's got the banana in the cage and it can't work out how to get it in its mouth now apparently as soon as the monkey grabs the banana it's doomed right because whoever set the trap doesn't have to creep out really quietly you can come out as loud as you like going yay fantastic gotcha lifetime in zoo for you because dan the monkey would rather hang on to the banana and get captured rather than let go now, I know that's a bit of a weird, you know, like, where's he going with that? No, but in terms of how many bananas have we got in our heads? Yeah. How many How many thoughts, as everybody listening, how many thoughts uh, I've, do you continue to think that aren't serving you well, but you continue to think those thoughts? And even worse, how many of those thoughts then manifest in behaviors, and those behaviors are not serving you well, but you continue to do those behaviors? So part of being your best self and living your best life, for sure, I can teach you a whole load of new stuff. Human beings are really good at learning new stuff right but we're really bad at 
unlearning, right? So to be your best self, of course, you need to learn some new stuff. But equally, what you're alluding to, you've got to let go of the bad stuff. You've got to stop. I mean, self-harm is a strong word, but if most people have got a voice in their head. If you spoke to anybody else, how you speak to yourself in your head, you wouldn't have any friends, right? No. We're beating ourselves no. up all the time and, we're, yeah. and we've got so many riddled with bad habits. But the unlearning piece, the letting go, understanding what your personal bananas are and stopping doing them, that is much harder to do than learn a whole load of new stuff. But you've got to do it. That, it's the unlearning. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> That's yeah, no, I, absolutely. And actually, j- just to kind of come back to a point we made a bit earlier on, right? We, we're talking about money buying happiness and in retirement, what to do with money. One of those bananas that people hang on to because they've learned is to not spend their money, right? They've had this, this years of a, of a habit of saving. They've witnessed their parents not spend their money and their grandparents not spend their money typically because people are really scared scared about running out of money when there's no more money coming in. So the, the learnt belief is there not to spend it. And we know, all the stats are telling us, that on average, people only spend about 30% of their money in retirement by the time they get to 90 because they're more fearful about running out of money than they are about wasting their life. And that's a banana that they're hanging on to. Um, and, and, we, and, and I do huge amounts of work and spend a huge amount of time with people um, and it's not a one and done thing, right? You're not going to do this in one conversation because we're trying to unwire 30 years of stuff that people have observed yeah. and witnessed. But, you know, when you start saying, you know, there are things you can do with your money, spending your money on um, new and novel experiences with the people you love will make you happy. Giving your money away will make you really happy, by the way. That's proven in science. Um, And buying your way out of doing things that you don't like doing and suck up your time. So let's figure out how we can not hold on to those bananas and we can make sure we do. I mean, it's that is such a, an important thing to understand, right? In order for us to let go of those and, and enjoy life. Yeah. Well, people will die clutching bunches of bananas, won't they, with all the riddled, ingrained habits of thinking. Often our thinking isn't even our thinking. It's passed down from our parents and grandparents. Essentially, you're you're absolutely right. Yeah. So it's rethinking how you think. and But letting go of bad habits, that's the hard part. Is, um, what I'm trying to say is that's the harder to do than it is to learn. I could get you. It's easy. We're so good at learning, but so bad at unlearning. Yeah. Well, the, bra- the brain is... Um you know, you know this better than me, but the brain doesn't like to burn calories, right? It's a lazy thing. We need to be intentionally kind of doing stuff. So the brain will always go to the easiest thing that it can possibly do. And that's probably taking more information rather than dealing with the baggage that it's holding on to. So we need to be really intentional, right? Yeah. So I think, I don't know if it's true, but somebody, you know, lots of people, psychologists say we have got about 80,000, we have about 80,000 thoughts every single day, but about 75,000 of those thoughts are the exact same thoughts you had yesterday (laughs) and the day before. <laughs> so actually we haven't got any new thoughts creeping in we just get we get grooved into your brain that thought that trigger um so actually we're back to rethinking your thinking creating new pathways neuroplasticity means no however old you are your brain will still shape it's like play-doh it can learn loads of new stuff but I, and i think maybe in terms of uh i think pushing the comfort zones a little bit i think as you get older and i find myself doing this is you do like your routines and you do like your habits they make you feel safe and comfortable and daring to push it a bit, actually, daring to go to new places, daring to try new things, daring to try new foods. I think that's part of like it won't always work, but you're pushing it a little bit. Um, and I think that's quite quite neat. But you, obviously, as you get older, you've got your favourite holiday destination, you've got your favourite pub meal, and I get I get all that. But just shake it up a bit, vary it a little bit, have a you know have a bit of adventure in your life. Yeah, I say the two most powerful words in retirement are yes and no. Right, you say yes to scary growth stuff because we need to make sure that we, you know, our, our brains are wired to move forward. Right, we like as human beings, we like to, we do like to learn new things, but sometimes we get a bit lazy with it. So say yes to new things, try them. Doesn't mean that you're on that road forever. If you don't like it, you haven't enjoyed it, go and try something else. And then say no to things that you don't want to do. Because again, if we're thinking about our mental well-being, one of the challenges I see for people in retirement is that they believe they've now got all the time in the world. They need to fill their time because they haven't come up with a good time plan. So they end up saying yes to a load of stuff that they don't want to do. And it really, really annoys them. And, and so we need to learn to say no better. I think as actually as a general population, that would help our well-being a lot more. If we say no to things we don't want to do, um, 
but yeah, I think that's 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 really important. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, say yes to. There's something in positive psychology called Dunbar's number, which basically says that you spend about sixty percent of your entire life with a really small circle of between um, twelve and fifteen people. So this is your tribe, it's your clan, it's your it's your be- it's your absolute closest family and friends. So we've all got between twelve and fifteen people. Sixty percent of your life is spent with those people. I would say yes to those people. All right, I would say yes to spending more quality time with those people. And no to a lot of the other stuff if 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 you if people are asking you stuff and they're not in those 12 to 15 then particularly as you get older surround yourself with those 12 to 15 because that's where your happiness will be with strong personal relationships with those 12 people yeah what a great tip and that i know and i've read a lot about the harvard 85 year study and i quote it a lot on the podcast right it's you know the number one determinant of a happy and long life is the quality of your relationships the positive relationships not diet not food not all of that, you know, exercise, it's the quality of your relationships. Um, and I totally agree. Find your tribe and say yes to doing more stuff with those guys and girls. Yeah, fabulous. In terms of um, uh, just just one, one, one quick thing, so I'm sure we'll wind it up in a minute. But I think, again, it's an, it's an old thing as we get a bit older, is the power of presence, the power of um, actually being there. I read some, I don't know if you saw it, the Louvre, the museum in Paris, published some data on the Mona Lisa. So Mona Lisa, which is the most kind of you know, famous painting in the whole world, apparently the, what they did was they measured the queue, right? It's about one hour 15 on average to get to queue to see the world's most iconic artwork. And do you know how long people stay there? So they've queued for an hour and 15. They stay there on average for 17 seconds. So what they'll do, what they'll do is they'll rock up at the Mona Lisa, they'll look at it, they'll then turn their back, they'll do a selfie, 17 seconds later, they've gone, right? (laughs) And I think there's this power of presence, this power of doing nothing, this almost, the the Dutch have got a word, uh, Nixon. Nixon is deliberately setting out to do nothing. And and so and it's really hard in the modern world because we're so distracted. So I think as we become a bit older and we are retiring, is lingering in the moment. And you know when you go to the Mediterranean on a holiday and the and you go to the town square, the village square, there's always a bunch of old people sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Right? Just, uh, yeah, 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 and that is it. That, that is happiness, right? Yeah. That's that contentment. That's the contentment that I spoke about earlier. That's not woohoo, crazy dancing around with jazz hands, but they are so happy doing nothing. And I think the Brits, we we almost like if I if you tried to do ten minutes of sitting looking out of a window, you'd go crazy with with agitation that you think you should be doing something and i think this quietening ourselves down being present with the people we love and actually deliberately being at ease with doing nothing is quite a skill absolutely i just want to spend a couple of minutes on this because i think it's so crucial right It it comes back to the point how i think happiness has evolved over the last 20 30 years and how it's evolved i think over the last six or not maybe not happens how things being present has evolved over the last six or seven years um there's nothing more than winds me up right and i'm a massive sports fan i play golf i play cricket i've done you know i I love my sport there's nothing more than winds me up than watching on telly people watching golf with their phones out taking instead of being present you know they're they're, they're in the crowd there's tiger woods there's rory McIlroy, and they're not even watching the thing they're more concerned about getting it on camera than being present in the moment um and i just think that has moved on so rapidly in such a short space of time that we have no idea how to cope with it as human beings and like you rightly said the power of doing nothing and being present with no distraction and sitting and thinking like it's a sad sad world where that has been lost so i'm really interested just a couple of minutes from you about how that's evolved why it's done what it's done and why we just you know why these social media companies know how to get us addicted to this stuff and how important it is just to take that downtime maybe that's a whole new episode andy isn't it <laughs> i love the passion yeah but but you're right people are so busy trying to capture the moment that they're completely missing the moment Oh, they, you've just you've just said it in about ten seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but we want to capture it so we can share it so everybody else thinks we're living the life. Look uh, at me with Rory McIlroy doing it. Yeah, and it, it, because social media is attractive, you know, you, you, your life. You want to put it on your show reel. Look how good everything is. But you never you never post mm. your bad days, do you? <laughs> right. yeah. 
So <laughs> Social media's got a lot to answer for, I think. And it's, I call it anti social media, actually, particularly Twitter. As a football fan, mate, you go on Twitter at five oh. o'clock if your team's lost. Yeah. Oh my gosh, the anger, the bile. Yeah. It, it is so, there's so yeah. many angry people out there. And I think, I think maybe we'll leave you listeners with this. I think in the modern world, if you want to be that best version of you, actually, quite often it's looking around what, what everybody else is doing and not doing that. The, the, the screen time, the, the social media is another banana. We need to, let go of some of that and if we and all that time that we save that we're not doom scrolling we invest that time with our 12 people then that maybe is uh, the secret to happiness right there i think that's a wonderful place to end such a brilliant conversation i think we could probably speak for about i reckon we could do a whole season of the podcast just me and you right i mean there's so much to talk about um so thank andy i i appreciate your time massively um i love the work you're doing um i'm going to put links to all of this into the show notes you've got some great um kind of workshops coming up thinking about behavior and leadership and social media detox and uh, the art of being brilliant which every I, I really want to be brilliant so that's that's really cool um you know and i think it, it's so important the work you're doing so i put all the all all the uh, all the notes on there as well as your books which are uh, which are phenomenal so the Thank you for coming on. Thank you for the work you're doing. And um, yeah, really appreciate it. Well, right back at you, mate. Thanks for being interested. Really, really appreciate that. Um, as I say, links to everything Andy's been doing um, uh, throughout his wonderful career be uh, on the show notes. Please go and check them out. Go and buy the books on Amazon. The links are on the website. The courses are there. So please do. Um, and thank you once again for everybody listening in to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Until next time, take care. Thanks for tuning in to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. I hope this show will arm you with insights, strategies, and a newfound excitement for navigating life beyond the nine to five grind. Remember, retirement isn't just an endpoint, it's a vibrant chapter brimming with opportunities for growth, adventure, and purpose. Keep exploring, stay curious, and embrace the next phase of your life with enthusiasm. Until next time, may your retirement dreams continue to flourish and inspire.